Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Baptist Church on Sunday the 5th of July. Goodness, can you believe that it's July already? You certainly wouldn't know it, would you, to look out of the window. Now before we uh, get into the sermon properly this week, I've just got a couple of notices, a few, uh, just a couple of little things that I need to let you know about. And the first is that um, I guess over the weekend you'll have noticed that many different things have been reopening, things like pubs and restaurants and hairdressers and whilst uh, it is true that the government guidance has changed and so we would technically now be allowed to open up the church building for services um, myself and the deacons believe that actually now is not the right time to do that and there's a couple of reasons for that firstly the services that we would be able to have with um, just a maximum of 30 people being able to attend and with no singing and no socialising before or after. We don't believe that they would be a full expression of church as we know it. And secondly, we believe that actually there is still substantial risk in gathering together. And we want to ensure that when we do um, begin to meet together again here in the church building, that it is as safe as possible um, to do so. And so therefore, for, for the time being, we're just going to continue with these online services. Um, and obviously, as things change, uh, I will keep you updated. The second thing just to say is that um, many of you will have seen or will have heard um, from the information that came out last weekend that our building here has been included um, in the Bake Up 2040 vision funding bit um, and I know there's been a little bit of confusion uh, around that and so I just wanted to reassure you that, um, that any funding for our building which will only come if the bid is successful and that is by no means guaranteed but if any, uh, any funding that does come toward our building um, is going to go toward making our building more accessible um, as well as making the best possible use of the, uh, the different spaces that we have here in the building. And those are projects that we had already begun to talk about and had already begun to plan for um, pre-lockdown. Um, and it is certainly, it's not the case um, that our building is being taken over in any way, nor that we um, are moving out to new premises and we are definitely, definitely um, not um, closing down. Um, so hopefully that just reassures you um, about that and it's probably worth saying at this point that we um, are excited about uh, the Bake Up 2040 vision, we're excited about all the different ideas and plans that have been put forward to make our town a more vibrant, um, a more um, exciting place uh, to live and we look forward um, to seeing how that progresses uh, and we're really excited as well about being included um, in that bit. Right, let's move on then to today's sermon. And you might remember um, from last week that we are currently in a series looking um, at some different biblical metaphors or images um, for God. And, and we actually began that, didn't we, a couple of weeks ago when we thought about God um, as a father. And that's a fairly common theme, isn't it, throughout the Bible, um, especially in the New Testament. Um, Jesus refers to God as Father a lot, um, and so in the Gospels and then um, on into the New Testament, this idea of God as a Father um, is a very, very common um, theme. And then last week we had uh, another fairly common image um, as we thought about God as a shepherd, which again comes up again through Scripture. It's, a, it's an image that we are familiar with, um, aren't we? You may also remember, of course, that I promised that we uh, would start to look at some of the less common images for God, um, which are contained within the Bible. And we're going to begin that this week um, as we think about the image of God as a mother. And you may, you may well be saying now, well, you know what, that's not that unusual, Dave. We know that God is described in Isaiah as being like a mother who comforts her child. And that Jesus describes God as being like a mother hen who gathers her brood under her wings. But you know what? I think even though we know those images, they are not images that are commonly used within the language of our worship. 
For instance, the Methodist Church made national news just over 20 years ago when they included in their worship book a prayer which spoke of God as our father and our mother. It was so unusual. It was the first time that a church had, had kind of um, published a prayer like this. Um, and like I say, it was just 20 years ago, not that long ago. And then more recently, and perhaps more uh, closer to home, um, the Baptist magazine, um, Baptist Together, in spring of last year, 2019, in an, in an edition which was focused on uh, women in ministry, it featured a number of uh, prayers and liturgies from a feminine perspective. And the ones which referenced God as mother or as female in any way proved to be so controversial that many churches refused to even accept copies of that edition of the magazine. And even now, the page which contained those prayers has been removed from the online version. Um, and you know what, it's not just um, in prayer that God um, as father is a more favoured image than God as mother. I wonder how many hymns or worship songs can you think of that describe God as a mother? And now maybe just for fun, compare that number to how many you can think of that talk about God as our Father. Incidentally, while we're talking about songs, the, in the song uh, suggestions that accompany this sermon online, I've included um, the only song that I know of when may not be the only song out there but it's certainly the only song I know of which speaks of God in feminine terms. It's called um, Enemy of Apathy and it's by John Bell of the Iona community and it's actually written about the Holy Spirit but it's the closest uh, I could get. And I guess at this point whilst we're talking about song selections that I put with the sermons please do check out um, some if not all of the songs that I suggest uh, to go along with the sermon because I can tell you that that choosing which songs to include is often a longer and more painstaking more arduous process than actually writing and recording the sermon and I'd hate to think that you know it was a pointless exercise so please do like I say check some of those out Anyway, let's go back uh, to the sermon and the idea of, of God as mother. And, and you know, whilst that image of God as mother is often controversial, as we've just seen, the image given in today's passage from Isaiah chapter 42 is perhaps the most shocking one of all. Isaiah chapter 42 verse 14 says this, For a long time I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labour. I will gasp and pant. Not here the cosy image of a maternal love with a mother comforting or protecting her brood, but rather the image of a woman in labour. A moment that the majority of mothers will have to pass through but one which is not often discussed in any great detail, or certainly without, uh, outside of the bounds of antenatal classes, perhaps. And you know what? It is perhaps a shocking, maybe even uh, disturbing thought for many of us to picture God in that way, as a woman groaning in pain, red-faced, dripping with sweat as she strains and pushes, gasping and panting her way through the overwhelming waves of pain which accompany the birth of new life. That's probably not how we normally view God, is it? But you know what? It is an image which is included in Scripture. And so therefore, contained within there, there must be something about the nature of God for us to grasp. And there's a couple of things about this image which stand out to me in particular. Firstly, from a biblical perspective, 
pain in childbirth is linked inextricably with the story of the fall. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 we read that pain in childbirth is meted out as a consequence of the sin which leads to Adam and Eve being evicted from the Garden of Eden. And so I guess from that perspective this image perhaps speaks of a God who far from being distant and removed from his fallen creation actually chooses to draw near and places himself within it. The writer uh, Lauren Winner in her book Wearing Gods puts it like this. She says, uh, Isaiah's metaphor converts the groans of childbirth from a sign of humanity's fallenness to a sign of God's intimate identification with us. Or rather, in Isaiah's metaphor, the groans of childbirth are both a sign of humanity's distance from God and a sign of God's nearness to us. And they are the second exactly because they're also the first. But I think there's also something else going on here. This part um, of the book of Isaiah was written whilst um, a significant slice of uh, the Judean population was living in exile in Babylon. Jerusalem had been politically and militarily trounced. And both leaders and ordinary people had been forcibly removed from their homes. They'd been separated from family and friends. And they'd been made to live um, in alien territory with no realistic hope of imminent return. And this, like I say, this section of of Isaiah um, is written to let those exiles know that God has not abandoned them, that God is present, that he is at work, tending to God's people even now, even though they may have felt forgotten uh, and renounced. And in the part just before this image of a labouring woman, God has announced that the old things are passing away and that soon he will bring about something new. And then we get this striking, shocking, disturbing image. I wonder if sometimes, um, like me, you imagine that for God to bring forth something new It's just a simple process. After all, he is all-powerful, isn't he? And so surely just a click of the fingers and all can be made right. However, I think here we get an image of a creation process that is difficult. One which displays God's strength. Because after all, what is a more powerful image of strength than a labouring woman drawing on all her reserves of strength to persevere through the pain in order to bring forth new life. But that strength alongside his vulnerability. Because is there a more vulnerable situation than that uh, encountered within the process of childbirth? And it is perhaps fitting that this image comes within this chapter because the beginning of Isaiah chapter 42 is often thought to be a reference to the coming Messiah. Verse 1, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. And it is in the person of Jesus that we see God's strength and vulnerability mixed together. That we see in order to bring forth something new that God must enter into the pain and brokenness and make himself vulnerable. Suffering pain and hunger and temptation and even death in order to bring redemption and restoration to his creation. 
Again, the writer Lauren Winner describes it this way. Isaiah is writing to reassure the exiles of God's abiding interest in them and to reassure them that God is sovereign. A woman in labour is a curious picture of sovereignty. A woman in labour cannot protect herself. She is dependent on others. And at the same time, she is ex exercising a profound power. She is receiving help and at the same time, her body is strong and knows what to do to deliver. Hers is a sovereignty in which the best tool is not a scepter or a gun, but breath. Panting, groaning, bellowing. In their darkest hour, the exiles wondered, God, where are you? In his final hour, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the image of the labouring woman, we see that God does not respond with silence. God groans, gasps and pants, making a new way for the exiles breathing life into the whole of creation, offering God's own body to be broken open for the sake of the world God created. And so may you today know God as your mother. The one who draws near to you in the mess and brokenness of this world and who offers herself for you bringing forth new life in you and for you through her active participation in the process of redemption. And we're going to finish with the prayer that I spoke of earlier from the Methodist worship book, the one which made national news just over 20 years ago. Let's pray. God, our Father and our Mother, we give you thanks and praise for all that you have made, for the stars in their splendour and the world in its wonder, and for the glorious gift of human life. With the saints and angels in heaven, we praise your holy name. Amen.